This video is brought to you by Brilliant. As Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill became First Minister of Northern Ireland in early February, a historic first, she said she anticipated a referendum on Irish unity within the next 10 years. Separately, the party's president, Mary Lou Macdonald, said a united Ireland was within touching distance, believing a referendum will be held by 2030. While not quite as short a timeline as the one from Star Trek, the Irish unification of 2024, and their comments and the context of Sinn Féin's success on both sides of the Irish border have brought the question of Irish reunification under the spotlight. So in this video, we're going to explore how a referendum could actually happen and what the polls, shifting demographics, political sands and more say about the prospect of a united Ireland. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Ok, to avoid any confusion, let's quickly define some terms used in this video. When we say Republican or Nationalist, we're referring to the side that wants Northern Ireland to leave the UK and form a united Ireland with the rest of Ireland. In contrast, when we talk about Unionists or Loyalists, we mean those who want Northern Ireland to stay part of the UK. Now, before we get on to Northern Ireland's future, we do need to go through a bit of context. But this is not a history video, so for the sake of time, this is obviously not going to be a fully comprehensive run-through of the history. Anyway, back in 1921, after the two and a half year Irish War of Independence, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed, establishing the Irish Free State, which would go on to become the Republic of Ireland. But as you'll know, this didn't cover the entire island of Ireland. The British had carved out six counties in the northeast, which became Northern Ireland, that were majority Protestant and Unionist, largely as a result of colonisation from Great Britain in previous centuries. Though it's worth pointing out that these counties still had a pretty sizeable Catholic nationalist minority. Now, let's skip forward to the late 1960s, which is generally when historians agree is the beginning of the Troubles. The frustrated Catholic minority in Northern Ireland launched a civil rights movement demanding an end to things like housing and workplace discrimination. As civil rights marches were violently suppressed by the overwhelmingly Protestant Royal Ulster Constabulary, as well as being attacked by Protestant loyalists, riots erupted in 1969 in places like Belfast and Derry Londonderry, and the British Army was deployed under Operation Banner to counter the growing disorder and sectarian violence. However, things only escalated. The Provisional IRA began its armed and violent insurgency against British rule, and on the other side, loyalist paramilitaries like the Ulster Defence Association and Ulster Volunteer Force also stepped up their violent campaigns. More than 3,500 people would be killed, more than half of them civilians over the next three decades, before the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement was reached, basically ending the troubles and marking the transition from an armed struggle for a united Ireland to a political one. So politically speaking, how could Irish reunification be achieved? Well, the Belfast Agreement actually established and sets out the process. The agreement recognises the right of the people of the island of Ireland to bring about a united Ireland, subject to the consent of both the Republic and Northern Ireland, meaning so-called border polls, i.e. referendums, would need to be held on both sides of the border. So when and how would these referendums come about? Well, the Northern Ireland Act 1998, which basically implemented the provisions of the Belfast Agreement in UK law, states that a border poll would be called by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland if, at any time, it appears likely to him that a majority of those voting would express a wish that Northern Ireland should cease to be part of the United Kingdom and form part of a united Ireland. It's not exactly clear what the requirement for this would be, so it's effectively up to the discretion of the Secretary of State. Maybe they'd call one if there was consistent polling suggesting a majority in favour of reunification, or if voters elected a nationalist majority to the Northern Irish Assembly. If the Secretary of State did call a referendum, then the Irish government would presumably arrange one for their citizens too. So, how are demographics and attitudes shifting in Northern Ireland? There have been some notable milestones recently, suggesting things might be going in the direction of reunification. The 2021 census revealed that Northern Ireland, for the first time in its history, had more Catholics than Protestants. 
Now, it's worth pointing out that religion doesn't directly translate into political preference as much as it used to in Northern Ireland. But the census also registered a decline from 40% to 32% in individuals identifying solely as British, while those identifying solely as Irish increased from 25% to 29%. Accompanying this is the fact that in the 2022 Northern Irish election, Sinn Féin emerged as the largest party in the Northern Ireland Assembly, earning them the right to nominate the First Minister. Here's Lewis Goodall, then at the BBC, explaining the significance and the caveat on election night. Sinn Féin, a nationalist party, has topped the poll. That has never happened before in the 101 year history of Northern Ireland's existence. Northern Ireland was literally designed, its borders were designed so that that wouldn't happen, so that there would be an inbuilt unionist majority. And indeed, if you top up the unionist parties, they're still on top. If you put the DUP together and you put the UUP together and you put the TUV uh, together, a relatively new party, they still have a plurality of the votes. But the fact that you have a nationalist party coming top really does transform the political landscape in Northern Ireland, not least because... A year later, in 2023, Sinn Féin won the local elections, and in another historic result, nationalist parties won a greater share of the vote than unionist parties. Another factor that could easily add momentum to the Irish nationalist cause is if Sinn Féin enters government in the Republic of Ireland, where it currently pulls ahead. One can imagine that a Sinn Féin-led government in Dublin would seek to boost cross-border cooperation and development in a way that might help drive support for reunification. This is sort of happening already, even without Sinn Féin. Very recently, the Irish government announced an €800 million Euro package to fund cross-border infrastructure projects. The other important realignment that's happening in Northern Irish politics is the growth of the non-sectarian bloc represented by the Alliance Party, which rejects the nationalist versus unionist identities and says it doesn't take a position on the constitutional future of Northern Ireland. Alliance is now the third largest party in the Northern Irish Assembly, behind Sinn Féin and the Democratic Unionist Party. But what about actual polling for a hypothetical reunification referendum? Polling does vary, but generally speaking, the status quo position, staying in the UK, seems to secure about 50%, while Irish reunification gets relatively less support, with one recent poll putting support at 39% and another at 30%. So evidently there's not majority support for reunification now, and therefore not the grounds for a referendum now or in the near future. But when you consider there is a sizeable don't know contingent, and considering the growth of the non-sectarian alliance party, there is evidently a group of people that are not wedded to either unionism or nationalism, and who could potentially be won over, meaning that these are the people who will be key to deciding the future of Northern Ireland's constitutional status. Therefore, campaigners on both sides cannot rely solely on identity. Increasingly important are questions of which constitutional setup can best deliver on people's priorities, like housing, healthcare, employment, and more. A lot of stuff we talk about in our videos can often seem pretty complicated, especially when we dive deep into detailed data and economics. But there's a fun and easy way for you to learn more about these topics, which doesn't cost thousands of dollars or take years and years of studying. That's because Brilliant is the best way to learn maths, data science, and computer science interactively. And the fun thing is, it doesn't take long to learn either. These complex topics are broken down into small and accessible chunks, designed around your busy schedule, whatever your skill level. That means that if you spend just a few minutes a day, you can gain new knowledge over time, in an actually fun way. As time goes on, you'll get used to that feeling of learning too, because this isn't just about sitting down and reading. Brilliant teaches you by doing, using active learning to teach you the principles of otherwise quite complex topics, and ensuring you understand what's actually going on. So whether you want to brush up on your basic math skills, improve your employment prospects by learning about future technology, or just have fun with coding, then you can check out everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days by clicking the link below. Plus the first 200 of you that sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's premium annual subscription. Thanks for your support.